a special guest star here today. This is Nigel Harstad, who is a um, colleague of mine in the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies, and who also um, teaches um, in the comm department, various comm classes. Mm -hmm. And he is also an amazing photographer. Thanks. So you're welcome. So he agreed to come in and just talk through sort of what we're going to be doing this week and um, maybe share some tips that he has um, and tell me if, like, I'm asking you to do stupid things. I don't think I'm asking them to do anything stupid. I mean, it's you. But That's true. No, it's I'm possible kidding. I am. So what do you think of the bunker? I mean, you know, uh, it could use some window treatments. It could but... use some window treatments. I have started to decorate. Oh, that um, the, the, the pig is in here. Sheriff pig, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, just trying it's... to... You know, make the place feel a little more homey. It is spacious. It is spacious. I know. My office is actually not particularly spacious, but when you're in the bunker, it feels spacious, doesn't it? Because it keeps going and going. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it doesn't actually keep going. Um, so anyway, this week, photography. Mm -hmm. um, I explained this in the intro video, but I'll recap a little. This is a class that fulfills ALPP, which is Creative Process at Mary Washington. Mm -hmm. So it's a class that's meant to help students develop their creative habits and think more creatively and produce creatively, but it's not an art class, okay. right? It's actually a computer science class. Mm -hmm. So there's no expectation that only artists can succeed at this class. In fact, um, we very rarely have students take this class from an arts discipline because mm -hmm. um, they're usually fulfilling that gen ed through their, through their major. So um, this week is when we move to photography um, because we're trying to get students, we want everybody to start thinking about stories and the visuals of stories and how we tell stories using, using visuals, in particular, our own photos. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to start by kind of walking through the work that the students are going to be doing, and you can jump in at any time. I may invite you to. Okay. Um, just to give everybody an idea of what to expect this Sounds week. Sounds good. So let me just get this lined up over here. Um, so let me switch over to the computer. So this week, improving your photography and thinking about visual storytelling. So um, everybody in the class comes with different levels of experience with photography. I suspect there are lots of students who have um, mostly use like their phone to take photos. Can you take good photos with a phone? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I started out uh, really getting into photography with my cell phone and with a GoPro camera. Right. Which is pretty limited. Right. Super so. low, like low cost, and not... And there are some days when I'll be out in the woods uh, with, you know, like four thousand dollars worth of gear, wearing full head to toe camo, and the best photo I get is with my cell is phone. with your cell phone. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we get further down. So don't worry if you don't have great equipment or if you've never really thought about yourself as a photographer. That's not what this week is about at all. Um, so we're going to talk about improving our photography skills, and the first thing we're going to do is review this page called Tips for Better Photography. Um, I'm just going to switch over to that. This is was called from a book called 10 Ways to Improve Your Craft. None of them involve buying gear. Um, <laughs> by a guy named David Duchemin. Um, and we've used these tips to great success before in DS106. So um, we'll kind of go through these one by one, and you can tell me what you think, Nigel. The first sure. one is get pickier. So what does that mean to you as a photographer? So uh, I would say, you know, if you're new to photography, don't get discouraged because we have what's called a keeper rate and for every photo of mine you see there's one keeper for several images that right. I, no right. one ever sees yeah so um but getting pickier is just you know really if you have an idea in mind don't stop until you get it and right. don't settle for you know something you're not happy with yeah i think i think sometimes and i think i'm guilty of this too you know when i grew up pre-digital camera age we were super picky about photos because you had to pay to get stuff, yeah. um, um, exp you know, printed. Um, and so you thought really carefully about every shot and candids were a different kind of thing, even, you know, because you only had so many shots to take. Mm -hmm. Now in the age of, um, you know, cell, you know, smartphones and DSLRs, I think we kind of are like, ah, just take lots and lots of photos. Yeah. Like, something will look good. I know that's, my husband has said, like, that's his philosophy. Yeah, you call it uh, spray and pray. Exactly, you just yeah. spray like a machine gun. Yeah, and sometimes that's really effective, but sometimes what we want to do is actually stop and be a little bit more deliberate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because if you don't have an idea in mind and you aren't, you know, really 
trying to think through how you're going to get what you want to get, yeah. you're never going to get the photo you want right. if you're just clicking it's, the shutter. Exactly. So it's fine to take lots of pictures time to time, but it's also good to stop and really think more carefully about what it is you're trying to achieve. Yep. So that's what Get Pickier is. What about contrast? What do you think about contrast? Oh, I have a, I have a love-hate relationship with contrast. I'm trying to use more of it because I agree that, you know, uh, contrast is how we see details in photos. It's, uh, you know, can really bring out the dynamism, the, you know, the dynamics. Kind of challenges your eye in particular ways yeah, exactly. to, to pick up on details. And I think what's interesting about contrast here is sometimes when we talk about contrast in the context of photography, we assume we're talking about contrast, uh, like technical contrast. And, and that's where my mind lands. But, yeah. But yeah, definitely, you know, having photos with what you're getting at is contrast of like ideas of or subject matter. And yeah. Image, that can really... I mean, when you're trying to tell a story, not every situation has just one dimension to right. it. You know, even in this room with you and I talking, there are two people, two different emotions, two different stories. Right. There's a lot going on. Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about contrast, both in terms of the technical choices you make, but also in terms of your subject matter. Um, changing your perspective. I, you know, it's funny. I always hear this tip for photography, mm -hmm. but here's my thing. And I don't know if other people have this. I get super self-conscious. Like when you're out in public and you're taking a picture and suddenly you're crawling around on the sidewalk to get a better... Like, so how do you approach that? Well, I have gotten some weird looks, <laughs> sometimes from the police. Uh, but no, it's... Um, this is actually one of the tips that I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Because, you know, with a smartphone, uh, I get kind of spoiled. I have all of these lenses and I can make my camera do what I want. But when I'm out with just my cell phone, sometimes you do have to crawl around and do things. And particularly if you're trying to document the apocalypse, you know, and, and capture, like, expansive, desolate landscapes. Right. Try getting, like, something in the foreground of a space uh, really close to, like, the right or the far left edge of your camera. Because uh, cell phone cameras are often wide-angle cameras. Right. So if you can get something on the edge, it'll make the background uh, look more expansive because... It builds a contrast. Interesting, right? Yeah, it gives you it gives you something to play against. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, cool. Um, what about creating depth? I guess that can be kind of related to what mm -hmm. you were just saying. So looking for dimension. Yeah, looking for that dimension. Looking at um, just play around. You know, you'll you'll read some stuff on the rule of thirds, and they always say that's a rule that's meant to be broken because you can build depth mm -hmm. with that. The other thing is play around with how close you get to your subject, because even with a cell phone camera, you'll see more depth if you get closer to what's in the foreground and your background is farther away from your subject. You'll get that. Right. That, so playing um, with distance, both in terms of your distance from subject, but also your subject's distance from background. Exactly. Yeah. And both of those things can uh, really play with like how blown out the background right. is. Which can creamy, really change the mood of the photo. Exactly. Yeah. Um, get balance. So you just mentioned rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about rule of thirds. So the rule of thirds, I should actually know more about the science behind this. Uh, I know there's some like... To be right, honest, yeah. I don't. That's okay. Um, we won't tell. But uh, you can also think about it with motion too. So if you're trying to tell a story and you have a subject who might be moving, think about where they're facing. We often say if they're moving to the left, have them on the right third, looking mm. to the left. Otherwise, they're going to seem like they're running out of the frame. They're going to seem like they're running out of the frame. And yeah. you'll, you'll yeah. intuit it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I was going to show, I showed this to you earlier, I want to show the class, and I mentioned this in the write-up on this page, that there's actually a Google Chrome add-on that I recommend adding um, to your browser. I'm going to turn it on right now. And what it does is it overlays the rule of third on every photo on the page. So just looking at this photo, you can see how... Um, the subject lines up along the grid. So the rule of thirds is you have these basically nine mm -hmm. blocks that make up your rectangle. Um, and I don't know the science of it either, but some p people have proven, shown, yeah. um, that our eyes are drawn in particular to these, that these four center um, mm -hmm. dots are really what our brains tends to look to for the the most like the full important thing, yeah. elements of the image. And if you go up to the Smurf photo up above, you'll see even with photos where mm -hmm. you don't think that it applies. It still does. It Look, still the noses applies. are both lined up on those dots. Yeah, so yeah. oftentimes when I'm taking photos of animals or something, I'll line up one of the thirds with like an eye yep. or with their head or something like that. 
and at this point on most smartphones, there's a way to turn on mm -hmm. the rule of thirds grid, and certainly on DSLRs, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, you just have to play around with the settings. The settings a little bit. So a really great way to kind of just quickly up your game just by lining things up differently, by turning on that grid and sort of like thinking about how your photos line up. You'll really start to see the world differently. Yeah. Um, paying attention to the moment. So this is about like just kind of slowing down and waiting for that perfect, I'll turn off the rule of thirds now, <laughs> um, that perfect moment to capture. Um, how do you go about this? Like this seems to me like I think it's one of those things where we're like, it's like this magical thing, like photographers just happen to be in the right place at the right time and they get yeah. this amazing shot. But that's not the case because you're not actually a wizard. I mean, you might be a wizard, Nigel, I don't know. <laughs> but that's not what's behind your photography. Well, uh, I mean, part of it is uh, going where the action is. So, I mean, if you want to get a photo, you need to be where you're going to find your subject. Um, with wildlife, but also with people too, uh, you just have to watch a scene from a distance for a while and start to look for the patterns of where people are, where things move. And you'll start to see those patterns emerge and you'll start to see where the interesting things, interesting clusters of people, interesting lighting happens and uh, go from there. Cool, awesome. What about this one, looking to the light? So let's talk a little bit about light. So here's my, the only thing I really know about this. Well, I probably know a little more than this, but this is what I'll say is that I have totally realized that with my phone, which I rely on to take most photos, is that the quality of my photos depends entirely on how well lit my pictures are. Is that, a, is that just, I mean, I have a fair, an older iPhone. Is that like the nature of the kinds of cameras that are included in smartphones? Well, I could, I could go on for a very long time <laughs> about uh, smartphone sensor technology and histograms and yeah. how metering happens and things. Um, generally with smartphone cameras, if you're in a bright situation, your phone's gonna take better pictures. It takes better pictures, yeah. But if you're trying to go for like gloomy and desolate mm, and eerie, yeah. um, sometimes you kind of have to fight that. Yeah, um, you so have to work with it. You have to, you have to work with it, exactly. Yeah. So um, there are some apps that you can download that let you kind of manually adjust your camera settings to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely look for those. Yeah, interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, like the photo you have up on the screen now, um, your phone would probably try to brighten. It would just blow that out, right? Exactly. Because you're taking a picture of the sun. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, look for that. Um, yeah, I, that's a. There's so much in that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling. I understand. To yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. It's okay. I'm asking you to like distill, you know, years worth of experience into yeah. a like a tiny little sound that's, bite. That's a struggle, even with professional gear, of deciding, you know, what's the look I'm going for, and then how do I achieve it? But let's put another spin on this, which is that the beauty of this moment that we live in is that you can take lots and lots of photos and a lot of becoming a better photographer is experimenting, right? Exactly. It's playing with the variables, just like you do a science experiment. What are the dependent variables? What are the independent variables? What are you going to change each time? And teaching yourself, well, what happens if I um, change the, 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 my relationship to the light source yep. in this picture? Yeah, or change where the light is coming from. Right. That's often very important. Yeah. Um, and then you can do a lot in post-production, too. As long as your goal is not to accurately represent it for the news. Right, uh, which we're not doing for this class then, yet. Yeah, <laughs> then, uh, you know, you can Right. You, you can fix all that. Yeah. So. Um, this last one really applies to people who have DSLRs and who have lenses for those, using the best lens. Um, anything to say on that? Um, it, it, gear, you, gear acquisition syndrome yeah. is a problem is a disease. that I have. Yeah. And you... Lenses can be awesome, uh, and they can make a difference, but there's so much that you can do with cheap old cameras. Yeah. Uh, it's really how you use it. Um, you get diminishing returns if you're relying on the blast. Right, you're exactly. So if, if nothing else, though, it's important to know what the lens you have does, right? Yeah. Like understand what your lens is capable of and then work within... Oh, exactly. Within those limitations. Like, uh, like I have a certain lens that I use that makes people look fat. So I, sometimes you want to make someone look fat. You know, if I don't particularly. Please don't like use them. that on me. Yeah. But, okay. so, but I know that about my lens, right. so I don't <laughs> use it for that type of photography. Right. So unless somebody is looking to gain a little weight. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Expose for aesthetics. This really again has to do with people who have cameras where they can control things like shutter speed, aperture. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have an example for this because I couldn't decide what to use for expose for aesthetics. Um, um, so 
I, I mean, like, if you uh, want to show motion, yeah, the, what I'm seeing on the screen makes makes a lot of sense. Sometimes, if you just want to capture like a feeling, you can make some on a silhouette. Right. Where like if their face or what they look like or what they're wearing isn't important. Right. Sometimes their shadow can actually tell a story. Well, and can also take away the, the distraction right. of what's not important right. in the story. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's a great yeah. point. Like, sometimes we think that taking the photo is about capturing everything, but sometimes it's as much about what you choose to make less visible. Exactly. Um, what you choose to leave in the dark. And actually, this one, I think, is a great example of that. This is about foregrounding and background. Um, and in a sense, the foreground of this is is a shadow it's it, mm -hmm. i mean we're assuming that's an op like an opening in a in a cave or in a rock um between two rocks um that makes a really interesting uh frame or or viewpoint into the forest yeah but the foreground itself isn't visually anything very elaborate yeah and honestly uh, another thing you can do with a cell phone is put your entire image slightly out of focus uh, like like you're looking through like a rainy car window right? or something yeah like you can get do some that really deliberately. cool stuff yeah and actually, if we could pull up, I, I brought yeah. with a few images. It'd be the second one from the left. This one. Yeah. Um, oh, actually, the one to the left. That so, one, yeah. So here's an example of a pretty cool background, if I do say so myself. So tell us the story behind this photo. Uh, so I saw smoke out my window one day, and I, of course, grabbed my camera gear. As and, one does. Yeah, and went to the scene, and um, there was this massive fire in Lexington, Kentucky. And I just started taking pictures, and there's a whole album up online which uh, you can check out, but the news was there, so I decided to try taking pictures that showed emotion instead of trying to, like, be report a news the, Right, report exactly. the events. But in terms of foreground and background, this is one photo that has a pretty cool background. But now if we go to the next version of it, I think that it's so much cooler, even though this guy isn't doing anything, right. but kind of looking over the scene and looking yeah. tired, there's so much more to that story. There's so now. much more going on now, yeah. yeah. That there's someone interacting with that environment. Yep. Yeah. That there's something cool in front that, even though the background is the interesting it's, thing. Right, here, yes, yes. That's what actually gives the background meaning, yeah. is that foreground. Exactly. Which is really cool. What about these others? We had two others that you had um, pulled up. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in this photo. Yeah, so this photo, um, I was just messing around one night. This is one of the nights when the cops came and asked me what the hell I was doing. Is this from the old mill downtown? Uh, this is actually from the distillery district in Lexington. Oh, okay, this is in Lexington. Yeah, and the reason I wanted to pull up this photo is that you can take photos like this with a cell phone. And there's a couple techniques that I wanted to point out in there. The first is that um, I, I, in Lightroom, I boosted the clarity sliders. And honestly, even in apps like VCSO and um, it's just your basic phone editing apps, look for a slider or an adjustment called clarity. Okay. It's type of contrast. And you see all the bricks Why and all the, the grout vines. pops out. And, yeah. yeah. You can make things look really gritty. Yeah. And we're, we're thinking post-apocalyptic. Absolutely. That's what you know, that's you, what this is all about. Yeah, you want to show those cracks. Yep. Yeah. The Very other, cool. The other thing in this image is that there's a vignette. It gets darker around yes, the corner. Yes, this shadowing. Yeah. And that just, to me, I was trying to make it like, okay, it's, you know, as we look out away from it, it kind of goes off into the ether or, right. you know, into the shadows. Well, it's interesting, too, because one of the things I'm hearing from you, too, I think we, we get this a lot when we teach this in um, DS106, like this whole idea of, is it okay for me to use filters or edit in Photoshop or do posts on my, my images? And mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to tell people they can't do that stuff. But what I'm hearing from you is that absolutely you should do those things, but you should do them mindfully. You should do them deliberately. Yes. Um, don't just like throw a ton of filters on without understanding what it is you're trying to say. Exactly. And and with this image, what I was trying to look at is I wanted to bring attention to how run down it was. I wanted to bring attention to the imperfections. So I applied filters that did that, just that. That pulled that out. Yeah. yeah. And uh, again, my only caveat is if I was going to send this to a news agency and obviously, say that Obviously, that would be, you know, obviously, that would be a very different story you'd be trying to tell. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, photography is about telling a story and helping people see what you see in an image. Right. And what I saw was all of those cracks. Yeah. And, so I... and it conveys a feeling, you know, mm -hmm. you look at that image and you, and you get a sense of a particular emotion or feeling um, yeah. that you very deliberately are trying. It's a message you're trying to send us yeah. that comes through by those choices that you've made. Yeah. And the last thing I would say about this and then switching to the other yeah. one is color. 
Yeah. You know, look at the colors that I'm using. There, you can read up on the psychology of color, but there's blues and earth tones in here and grays and blacks. And then if we go to the last image on the right, yeah. uh, this is actually a, a photo that looks a lot happier, but <laughs> it's also at the end of a very long day of battling a fire. There's massive destruction. Everyone is tired. And you can still sort of you feel know, that feel yeah that. yeah you know you can feel the end of the day with the colors you right. can feel that sort of tiredness well so, and it's an interesting juxtaposition the, the the colors with the sun shining there's kind of a brightness to it but the but the subject matter is obviously yeah and it's a it's a darker subject matter but it to me i look at this photo and it looks to me like a hopeful photo mm -hmm. after like after the apocalypse right exactly the hope that that we can... And if you look at the whole album, there is sort of an arc where there's a beginning, a yes. middle, and an end, and the end is a lot happier. So, you know, when yeah. you're thinking about the story you want to tell, uh, I would, uh, not knowing what the story is, I would say don't just focus on the worst parts. Look for those moments of hope. That, right. You know, so, um... We call it positive deviance. What stands out in a good way? What I love about what you just said and what I think is such an important message for everybody in the class is... There was an arc to the story if you look at this entire gallery. And is it okay? Is this a public gallery? Can oh, yeah. I share this with the class? Absolutely. Yeah, so I'll share this as well um, in the notes for the video. Um, if you look at the entire gallery, as, as Nigel says, there's an arc to that story, but that is an arc that you chose to tell, right? Mm -hmm. You could have just as easily taken pictures or processed photos here that did not show a hopeful end, right? Uh, so. Absolutely. That's the other part of this that I think is really, really important, that the, the, the camera gives you power in terms of your ability to tell a story and control somebody's interpretation of events. Um, and you need to learn how to use that power. Absolutely. There were a lot of burnt out cars and buildings and unfortunately, you know, some dead animals and things like that right. that I could have... I could have pointed my lens right. out instead. Even this photo, you probably could have taken slightly differently or processed slightly differently to have changed the feeling that it evokes. Yeah, it could have changed the colors. I, the color in this photo is really where you get that feeling. That of, feeling of, of like of lifting. Of lifting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to walk kind of through some of. We've gone through all of the tips. I'm going to kind of just quickly go through everything else that we're going to be doing this week. Um, below those tips that we went through with Nigel are some other resources that I just ask you to kind of spend a little time looking through a few of those. They're, none of them are really lengthy, and they're just meant to kind of give you some other perspectives. Um, then we are going to be looking at a site. I want everybody to look at at least one gallery from this site called Abandoned America. Do you know this site, Nigel? I love it. Yeah. yeah. So Abandoned America is a website run by a photographer. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he goes out and photographs abandoned places. He gets permission. Yeah. He doesn't trespass. Um, and, and what are you saying? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. Um, and he's a, he's a great photographer. I want you to kind of look through at least one gallery thinking about it both in terms of the tips that we just talked through with Nigel and which ones you can kind of see in his photos, but also beginning to think about this aesthetic of the apocalypse. Like what does that aesthetic look like? Um, see if you can kind of identify for yourself how you would describe it. And then finally undertake what we call a photo blitz. Um, there's a link to it on our website. I'm gonna switch really quickly to the computer. When you load the photo blitz website, it will instantly give you seven prompts and the instructions are to take 20 minutes to try and do as many of these prompts as possible in 20 minutes. And, and you're gonna share them on Instagram with a couple of tags that I have noted. Um, this is supposed to be challenging. It's supposed to be fast. It's not supposed to be deliberate in the same way some of what we've been talking about is. Sometimes the way that we, um, sometimes the way that we try to experience creativity is by providing constraints. And this has time as a constraint in addition to the prompts. Cool. Um, and the idea is to get people sort of looking at the world a little bit differently, um, but not spending so much time that they get bogged down in their head yeah. on taking that perfect photo. Um, so you're gonna do that thing, it's called a photo blitz. Have you ever done anything like that before, Nigel? Um, not intentionally, but I think I might. Yeah, it's uh, fun. I mean, I've done things like the seven days of black and white. Right, yeah, and we've, in the past in DS106, we would do kind of a photo safari. Um, but we switched to doing the photo blitz because it's just a little, it's a, it mixes things up a little bit. And so finally, after you've done those three things, you're going to write up a blog post in which you kind of share and reflect on what you learned and what you did. 
And then you're going to do, you're going to read a short article called Photography and Narrative, and you're going to do six stars of visual assignments from the assignment bank, with at least four of them dealing with apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic narrative. And that'll be kind of our big photography unit um, for this week. So that's it. Well, thanks for having me in the bunker Thank you, today. Thank you, Absolutely. Come back and visit any time. You may want to in a few weeks. Y yeah, you know the way it's looking, I, I might. It's good. How have you been feeling? I've been asking everybody this because there's been a lot of nasty stuff going around. Yeah, you know, I was feeling a little under the weather, so I just kind of stayed away from people for a while. Yeah. And now I'm feeling good. But... Well, so here's, uh, this is what I want to ask you. So I was also feeling under the weather last week for a day or two, but I want to ask if this was your experience as well. I was, I was feeling sick. I said this to Jillian in the first video. Was feeling sick. Have you ever had this experience where once the sickness was gone, you actually felt like much better after being sick than you had been before you got sick? Did I that? Know it, yeah. Did that by any chance happen to you with this thing that's going around? Now like, that you mention it, yeah, I just feeling it, kind of like really alive and like. Well, I mean, I also got better over the weekend. So well, that helps. That. Yeah, but usually when I'm getting better, it's just this slow, endless slog. But this time it was just like, all of a sudden, hmm. I was healthy again, and I was 10 times healthier than I had been before I got sick. So what you're saying is that we should all go get sick more often. No, I'm not so. saying that. I'm just saying whatever is going around right now is just kind of weird. Yeah, it I is. I really just don't think of it. So. All right. Thank you, Nigel. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Martha.